Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much, Amanda. So <clears throat> I will try to take just uh, a couple of minutes and then because perhaps Christy and Jack have other stuff to add. The only thing I wanted to say, well, first of all, is thank you for the opportunity. I think it's probably the best uh, forum where to present uh, the working paper. And I think the timing is also right because if you read the paper, you saw that it's an advanced, it's, you know, I think an advanced working paper, but we have not submitted yet. So we really can um, consider seriously any and all feedback that you provide. And so for instance, you know, Empirically, if there's some interesting exercise that you think we have not considered, that would be great. Um, or if some of the ones that are there aren't convincing, you know, and why we'd like to know that. If you think that there's ways that the theory and the empirics can be tied uh, closer together, then, you know, that would be uh, useful to know as well. And <clears throat> I guess, I don't know, I, the, <laughs> the other thing I wanted to say is when I woke up this morning, I saw the Nobel Prize went to three economists who've worked on natural experiments and many of us in grad school probably read, you know, Angris is mostly harmless econometrics or something like that. And so I thought it's very, um, it's a good timing, you know, to print the paper because natural experiments are fascinating. Um, but I think we hope one of the messages in the paper is that uh, they're fascinating and some of us here have, you know, have engaged with them and, and, and use them, but they have to be done well and carefully. Um, so anyway, uh, that's all I wanted to say, but perhaps Christy and Jack have things to add before we get uh, discussion comments. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that's great. Let, let's uh, let's save the time for uh, for all the comments. For some reason, my name is stuck as John Payne on here. I'm, I'm Jack. I tried to change it, but I can't. But uh, yeah, please call me Jack. John, that's great. I don't have anything to add. All right. Um, well, thank you guys for sharing your paper. Um, I will ask Laura to provide some comments first. Yes. Uh, can you hear me okay, everybody? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you all for also for a very interesting read. I really enjoyed reading the paper, and I think uh, that's also good news because I think it's really well written, and it was just fun going through it. It's well argued, and overall, it was a really nice nice uh, read. Um, I think you do a lot to answer your big question of this common held idea that the drawing of colonial borders was a random or completely arbitrary act, and I think you do that well, and I think some of my comments just ask maybe to go a little bit further from that, and uh, I will start with a couple of theoretical considerations and towards the end go to some of the analysis parts as well. So one thing is uh, one thing I consistently and constantly had in mind while reading was state borders versus colonial borders. So of course there's a difference, there's some within colonial borders that became states. And uh, yes, so the question is, these are the salient ones that we typically talk about when we talk about this random process and, and why uh, post-independence some of those borders were kept. So maybe you have a little bit of insight on that. That could also be an empirical uh, uh, question. So do you actually find similar effects across the then emerging state borders? Relatedly, um, I think one big question that I also had was are there colonizer effects? So uh, you have these spheres of influence, um, but then we could wonder if there's a difference between how colonizers actually um, dealt with, uh, we know that they dealt differently with, with pre-colonial institutions. So how could this actually affect some of the border drawing on? So for instance, on which side of the border was the pre-colonial state? Is there some kind of qualitative in, uh, evidence that there was a negoti negotiation process over this? But it could also be that we can see different effects across different spheres. So for instance, the French-Belgian uh, colony border could be different from one with the uh, uh, British. Uh, yes. OK. Then I really like the dismemberment versus suffocation. And that was kind of a nice uh, uh, kind of frame for, for the article as well. Um, it does get a little lost because you don't you only focus on this question of where groups petitioned, where, where they uh, uh, or where they kept together. And maybe uh, the question would be if you could empirically go a little bit more deeply into 
the separating of uh, ethnic groups without pre-colonial states, like those with less hierarchy, and or the so with this Murdoch setup, you could do that. Um, and maybe also think about the, the suffocation a little bit more uh, in that regard, because you could extend your analysis based on this. And then um, I think with the pre-colonial institutions theory, you could actually go, you could use a little bit more evidence, more examples here, and I think you could go into more details. So one thing, one important thing to start with is it's not arbitrary, yes, but there was partitioning. And that variation is caused by the political institutions that were found by the colonizers on the ground. Um, and one important thing we know is that pre-colonial states is that is something that colonizers recognized. They saw a hierarchy, they saw a king, they had some kind of relationship towards that kind of institution. And so maybe they could just deal with them in a better way. There was this recognition thing. Mm. On the other hand, and you mentioned this, but I think you could, could do a little bit more there, pre-colonial states were functional and very differentiated political and economic entities. And it was easier to talk maybe to the hierarchy, high, high, higher, the king, the paramount chief, and so on. Um, but it's also it was also an economic question. So there could be a real interest in keeping those entities. And you can see actually as a counterexample that sometimes you would have these invented traditions on previously non-hierarchical uh, non hierarchical groups, just because it was something colonizers like to work with. So maybe you could go into a little bit more detail here. So partitioning them could be a high cost strategy in that regard. So again, the question on which side of the border did they sometimes then, maybe do you have some uh, qualitative evidence of that? Um, another point was that I thought uh, it would be interesting to see if there are more pre-colonial states close to colonial borders vis-a-vis -vis inside the state. And in that way, you could give some evidence for that they were actually uh, focal points for the colonizers themselves. So in the, because maybe that they were a way to, to really arrange the, the spheres of influence, and then they would really become those focal points. Yes. Um, also, I'm not 100% convinced that political entities were only defined by people and not so much by territory. So there are examples, of course, uh, the territory was much less fixed, but there weren't clear boundaries, but I think the territory was still an important um, point of reference. And I think um, I will go into an example just in a second on the Lozi where this actually was the case. Um, furthermore, I was wondering if there's some evidence uh, how soon these border negotiations resulted in actually effects on the ground. So I know from the Lozi example, for instance, that these borders were negotiated, but the Lozi king only heard about the, the final decision of the border three years later. And he actually didn't even notice that there was some kind of change in the territory until three years later. So maybe it would be uh, interesting, maybe you have something already we can see, okay, this actually could not integrate pre-colonial states as actors because they didn't even hear about this and they didn't feel it in the first place. And so they were excluded or another way, maybe included into the negotiation process. Mm. Yes, and then the laws are actually an interesting example. You have them as not split in, in your qualitative evidence. And I think to a degree that is true, but a part of the Southern territory has actually been truncated and uh, we see two, two self-determination movements, actually, one from Namibia, from the former, basically, Lozi group, and then, of course, by Rotsenland in, in, in Zambia. And the question is, uh, where is, where do you operationalize something as being non-truncated, not split and split? It's just a small part, but it was still a significant part for the Lozi. And actually, there were letters, and I'm happy to send some evidence on this, uh, where the Lozi King actually asked the UK, uh, the UK to be uh, the, the only uh, uh, colonizer in their region because they feared that they would be split up between different, different territories. And actually in this uh, Caprivi uh, region in, um, in Namibia, so the Subia as they're called, they were actually, there was first an exodus to the Lozi territory then the Germans tried to pull them back 
and then they build a paramount ch chieftaincy on top so that they have another kind of political entity. And so some new identities were actually by this border drawing were cultivated in that way. Yes, I will turn to a couple of questions on data and operationalization because I think it's uh, it's a fantastic job. I just had a couple of questions on this. So the Ayai and Crowder map on the pre-colonial pre state territories. I would like to know much more about how these maps were drawn. And of course, the biggest concern here would be if some kind of post-treatment bias could be introduced if people kind of had a feel that already knew the national uh, kind of territories and then kind of added to that um, in their drawing of the of the polygons. And I would just I would just love to hear more about this. Then the definition of pre-colonial states and your coding consistency, I think what you have in your main analysis is what Murdoch would call a large chiefdom. So anything that is beyond level two and beyond. So two levels beyond the local village and beyond. Whereas in the PCS coding of Murdoch, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you use the definition of states. So, so every, anything that he counts as a state level three. So maybe at least you could provide a robustness test here with uh, the more encompassing Murdoch definition when you do your ethnic group analysis. The other thing is that the big question is where to draw the line. So um, how do we operationalize the board and how do we take into account that there may be some errors in uh, border drawing? And here I would like to uh, point to that really great map in the appendix of Rwanda and Burundi, where uh, previous research has said, okay, this is actually uh, uh, ten percent is the rule, and this uh, that the that they are actually outside uh, that the state borders, sorry, didn't correspond to to the group polygons. And this is a very harsh definition. So maybe it would be good to think about questions where uh, uh, where we can actually incorporate some error in in uh, border drawing. Um, yes, and then the Brown Lie Encyclopedia, I think. It could also, you could also mention a little bit more on that. I think it was very interesting, the qualitative evidence that you used from it, um, but uh, could be elaborated on as well. Finally, I think for the analysis, you could run a sensitivity analysis for the regressions without good pretreatment controls, just to show how robust your, your uh, estimate would be to unobserved con confounding. And yes, these are my main comments. So thank you again for a very nice read and, and let me know if you have any questions? Thanks, Claire. John? Okay, so thanks, Amanda, for inviting me to, to take part in this, and congratulations to Joanne and Christy and Jack for a really fascinating paper. Um, so I think it, it's been an important paper because it challenges our assumptions in a really meaningful way. My um, assumption is that you know most of us who teach and work on, on these questions um, have relied on for a long time, and they use really creative data to justify those claims. You know, I think I've you know, probably, like many of you, um, I think I've always felt a little bit of discomfort around this issue because I teach the, you know, arbitrary border story, but then I also look at the map sometimes and it's pretty clear when you look at the map that that arbitrary border story doesn't really hold up too well or it's obviously much more complex than than we we acknowledge so i think that's what this paper does is it sort of gives us a license to embrace that discomfort without patting the Europeans on the back as if they, they did well by respecting um, local communities. Um, so it's really valuable in that sense. Let me just mention a few things that I think uh, that are excellent and that maybe can be reinforced um, in this paper. One is that um, I think in placing blame on the Europeans in sort of knee-jerk fashion, as we've often done when we tell the arbitrary border story, we, we overlook the agency of African leaders and decision makers. And this paper reintroduces them, I think, in a really uh, nuanced way, which is great. Um, I like also, um, as Clara mentioned, the underscoring that suffocation has been more impactful on communities in Africa than has dismemberment or you know the the groups at the at the borders that are partitioned. Um, you know I think it's it's worth noting that um, much of the contemporary cross border research that Joanne alluded to 
doesn't seek to suggest that the dismemberment is the bigger problem. I think it really the objective of that research agenda is really just number one to exploit the, the partition groups, um, you know, as something approximating as if random assignment, um, and then also to highlight the consequences of dividing peoples. Um, so, so that so that agenda isn't necessarily in conflict with the point you make about suffocation being um, more impactful. So I think that's it's a point that's well taken and, and maybe overlooked by those who promote theory. Of, of arbitrary border demarcation. Um, so that is really nice. I agree with, with Clara's point, by the way, that um, it maybe kind of gets lost. I guess that's, it, you make a great point, right? And that's, you're not trying to, you're not trying to study the suffocation side of it in this paper. Um, so I'm not quite sure what to do with that. It is, it's a really good point. And then there's, there's not much to follow it, but I think um, it, that's okay because your agenda is something different. Um, and then another thing I really like here is that you, you underscore the, the point that Dan Posner and I make in our paper that you cite, which is that it's really important to evaluate the historical context of any border that we use in our research, certainly for um, as if random divisions of peoples, and to ensure that indeed, if we're going to use a border, that it is one of the ones that was arbitrarily drawn. Um, so that's, and you make that point really clearly, and you come back to it in the conclusion in a, in a nice, eloquent way about making that a central feature of, of the research and not just something we do in the appendix, um, because it's absolutely critical. And, and the data you use in doing that and using the Brownlee data and in carefully developing qualitative data for all of the bilateral borders is really outstanding. Of course, I think the story is mixed. Um, but this study is an important check on our tendency to just sort of reflexively assume that all borders in Africa are, are arbitrarily drawn. Um, so to kind of get to the kind of central themes of, of my comments, um, it's that point I just made that the story is quite mixed. So we do, we do indeed see a lot of peoples in um, Africa that have been divided by borders. Um, and so that's and, and that affects local populations and can also, of course, serve as, as a research tool if we use it appropriately. Um, but that's the point I want to kind of underscore here is, is that um, your story can be right, but, but so can another. Um, so my first main comment is that I think um, as much as I, I really like what you're contributing here and we will need to you know, cite and talk about this paper when we teach and, and study the arbitrary border story. Um, it feels a bit like you all in this paper and the arbitrary border theorists, if we can call them that, are sort of talking past each other a little bit. Because um, you know, you can, so the conclusion here is that, so the Europeans um, acted in their interest first uh, and, this, and that process started with Berlin, um, though the actual demarcations took place thereafter. I think both you and the arbitrary border theorists would agree to that. And then sometimes the process followed pre-existing boundaries, at least loosely. That's the point that you make. Um, and then other times it didn't. And that's, that's the point that the arbitrary border theorists would make. Um, and then importantly, geographic features were a critical part of the story or a critical part of the evidence. And I think both you in this paper and the arbitrary border theorists would say that. So I think especially around the geographic features like lakes and rivers, I think that's where you end up kind of talking past each other because from your perspective, those things are demonstrating conscientious border demarcation on the part of Europeans. From the perspective of the arbitrary border theorists, particularly when those things cut through ethnic communities, they are drawn for um, purposes that suit the expediency of the Europeans without regard for the peoples on the ground. So yes, they account for a feature on the ground, but not the feature that is dividing peoples, which matters politically. So I think um, given that I feel like you and those scholars are sort of talking past each other a little bit. Um, for me, it kind of comes down to a question of of degree or share. Like, what are, and what are we? You know, should we entirely cast aside the story of of arbitrary border demarcation? I don't think you all would want to say that. So, so are you know, where do we find the sort of happy medium here? And and again, I think your paper is really important to getting us to acknowledge that and, and find that happy medium. Um, so, but if it comes down to the share or number of communities that are left um, divided, that to me is something that we, we sh if we think about it in terms of not just the pre-colonial states that existed, but also all the ethnic communities, the acephalous ones and, and the petty chieftains that you write about, um, to me, it's a question of thinking about the share of all of these communities that were, you know, either left whole 
by the process or divided. Um, but even that approach would favor um, the sort of non-arbitrary um, story because of so many ethnic communities of those smaller sorts that lie within the eventual colonial boundaries and and so we're not faced with division. So in fact something that would be you know not part of this paper but something that it strikes me would be important to do would be to consider the share for really thinking about how important a story is this it would be to think about the share of ethnic groups that are located at the intersection of competing colonial interests and to ask how commonly those groups, were divided because that's where the rubber hits the road. You know, if different colonial powers are interested in a general area and are competing over it, if they make decisions based on their interests and not um, the groups that are on the ground, then that's really where what um, this story is about. Um, so, and, you know, that that would and even if it happens just sometimes, this is a, another point that. Um, sort of resonates with me with this paper is that even if that happens sometimes, that would still be evidence that the arbitrary demarcation of borders was part of the European calculus. It was part of their method. Their method. So you know, this is a question of they're not going to apply it all the time, but if they're applying it some of the time, then we have to acknowledge that um, that this the theory of arbitrary border demarcation is a legitimate one. So we don't want to cast that aside. Altogether, um, a couple points about um, some of the empirical um, analyses that go along with these points that I'm making. Um, one is that you rely on the 50 or so pre-colonial states and and the extent to which um, actual colonial borders sort of replicate or mirror the borders of those pre-colonial states. Um, but of course, this is those are exactly the borders. The, those are exactly the ethnic communities, likely that. Um, uh, whose borders would have been respected as part of that um, strategic European approach to expediency. So, um, you know, this is, it's sort of the easy case, in other words, that these are the ones we'd expect to be respected or, or used as boundaries, but it's all its all those many other smaller groups where um, the question is really most important, I think. So um, if you were to extend the analysis beyond those that are the most obvious borders to respect, the story might be a little bit different. I mean, if you, you know, imagine how this would have played out. The Europeans would say, okay, we need to lay claim to valuable territories as quickly as possible, especially those where where we already have commercial interests or operations. We know that there are powerful chiefs and some well-defined pre-colonial states and kingdoms. Let's start there. Let's lock those up using the borders that they've sort of provided for us. And then we'll work amongst ourselves in carving up the rest. So it's that part, it's the carving up the rest where the arbitrary demarcation of borders really becomes an important issue. Um, and in fact, you, you note in the paper, you say it's, let's see, um, mm, I'll, I'll say that. But one thing that I noted, it seems to me in table two, that even of those 20 or, or even of those 50 um, pre-colonial states that you list, it seemed to me that 20% of them have had divided communities. So that this is the, the point that sort of stands out most to me is whether or not communities are divided. Um, a little, and to me, that's um, as important or more than the, the proximity of the actual, the colonial borders to the pre-colonial borders. Um, next, uh, just a, a comment or two about the, the water issues, uh, the, the use of water bodies and things. So I like your extension of the um, Michelangelo and Papalopoulos uh, analysis using showing that the squiggly borders are more likely to occur with um, pre-colonial pre states. That's kind of, kind of consistent with your story. But um, this is the sort of the big point for me is that the fact that ethnic groups with lakes and rivers within their territory were more likely to be partitioned, that you take as strong evidence in support of your argument, I sort of take it as some support for the alternative. Um, it sort of suggests to me maybe a, 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 a place in your argument where you're overlooking the, in, the importance of the division of peoples. Um, because if you think about lakes or rivers dividing an ethnic community and those being like those being used as borders, that suggests that the geographic features were used to facilitate your, the European task and trumped the status of the people on the ground. So again, I think this is an issue of your work um, prioritizing the proximity of 
new borders, if we can say that to old ones, um, in my mind, I'm thinking more about whether or not peoples were divided. And so when you have those kinds of features, geographic features that divided people, to me, like the bells go off and I say, that's it, yeah, there we have evidence of the Europeans um, arbitrarily picking a river or lake because it suits their interests, even though it divided peoples on the ground. So I think a little bit of discussion around or sort of um, confronting a little bit more directly the consequences of divisions of peoples on the ground, as opposed to just how the, the border itself was drawn and whether or not it corresponds to pre-existing boundaries. Um, and I'll just make a, a final point that's related to this one regarding some of the evidence used. I, I love the evidence. It's so nice. It's so careful um, with different types and so forth. It's great. A um, couple of the examples you show though, like figure six, um, looking at the Northern part of the Sokoto Caliphate on the Nigeria-Niger border, the example of the Rwanda-Tanganyika border as well. Um, it seems to, to me, again, to suggest a story that's much more nuanced than the one you suggest and that sort of underscores the expediency of the Europeans um, because it seems like in both of those cases, they opted for an arbitrary border demarcation, but then backed away from it only because of logistical problems or pressure from missionaries and so forth. So if that's the case, again, it's, it's a story of Europeans picking a line because it suited them best and then only backing away from it later. Um, so um, I think I would, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up my comments here by noting um, what an important contribution this paper is. And I really do think that once it's published, we will all have to talk about this in our classes when we teach the arbitrary border stuff and we'll cite it whenever we do, you know, any kind of cross border study and things like that. So it's incredibly important and I, I commend you for it. Um, I agree with the implications of, of this study, especially when it comes to the use of borders um, for sources of as if random divisions. Um, I think that's really important. And your, your, your point that we're in this study, you're not letting Europeans off the hook um, is also so really nice. So um, I think my suggestion, as, as polished as this paper already is, um, might be to just um, do a bit more to acknowledge the arbitrary border demarcation as part of the European strategy. I think maybe you're, you're making an effort to really pull the pendulum to the other side to say, hey, wait, 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 it's not arbitrary border division. Um, and and I think you could, I think you can not sacrifice too much of the paper by acknowledging that indeed there are times when the Europeans divided communities on the ground because it, it was best, for, it was easiest for them to do so. And that way you're not talking past that community of scholars so much, um, and, but also recognizing the point that you want to make about how um, valuable it was to take into account the pre-existing conditions on the ground. Congratulations on a great paper. Thanks, John. Okay, so at this point, I think um, before we give the authors a chance in case there's anything they want to say, um, I would like to open it up and see if there's questions or feedback from the audience. So if you have a question or some feedback, use the raise hand function under reactions. I'll give folks a second. Okay, let's start with Lindsay, um, then Elliot, Dan and Abit. Um, thank you for sharing this paper. I really enjoyed reading it and I can already tell how useful it's going to be for my own work. So thank you. Um, but I have kind of just one question that comes up for me and it's around the difference between borders within empires and across them. And I think this peeks out in some of the qualitative work and some of the discussion of the analysis about why these processes have kind of different outcomes or the similar outcomes, say, with between Niger and Nigeria or, say, Senegal and Mauritania. But I'm wondering if there could be a way for you to directly kind of include some kind of maybe just a couple sentences early on where you tell us if the logic when countries are competing, the you know, European powers are competing with each other is similar to the outcomes we would expect with arbitrary borders um, when they're within a particular empire. Um, and that's just kind of my thought and question. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, great paper. I want to echo what everybody else has said. This is really interesting. I, it's definitely something I'm going to cite in the future. I got three points, uh, starting from less, less important to more important. So first of all, you know, I, I, it'd be interesting for you to discuss 
uh, some um, ability to measure pre-colonial population across the grids. I, I, I know that's probably not possible. In fact, that probably isn't possible, but at least, but at least discuss why you can't do that, because I think that is important in looking at why the border might have been drawn a certain way in areas of high versus low population. Um, obviously, it'll correlate to some degree with the desert borders you're talking about, where you get a lot of straight lines. Um, the second one is, again, I don't have an answer to this, but I mean, the, the logic you're talking about, about the way the borders are drawn, I would imagine would apply internally as much as externally, right? In terms of between states and versus within states. You know, you look at, so again, the case I know the best is Uganda. The, the logic of drawing the borders between kingdoms and areas within Uganda are basically the same logic you're talking about uh, across states as well. And it'd be interesting to see if you could either extend the analysis to look at internal borders or at least discuss to some degree why the logic might be different uh, internally versus externally, not only in the colonial period, but also in the post-colonial period. I think that'd be a very interesting extension of this whole project is to think about how we draw borders, uh, you know, administrative borders um, in Africa uh, across uh, in, in post-colonial Africa. The third thing, though, the most important, and this is where I'm picking up, John has already alluded to this, um, rivers are different. I, re I think really, rivers are really quite different from what you're talking about in terms of lakes versus, uh, you know, uh, uh, pre-colonial state borders. Lakes, large lakes like Lake Victoria, Lake Albert, you can imagine Lake Chad, those are, those are obviously going to effectively divide kingdoms and divide people. But rivers often don't. Rivers actually actually bring people together, right? The Nile's the most obvious example. But we have lots of other examples of, of states where the states existed on both sides of the river, right? So that rivers actually are, are very poor uh, dividing line, right? You give the example of Rwanda where it was actually a natural border. Um, but we can think of examples like the Kingdom of Congo and others where actually, again, uh, you know, the, the, the civilization, at least the, the state and the ethnic group existed on both sides of the river. And so by using those rivers, you're actually creating artificial borders, even though it looks natural, quote unquote natural, it's not natural in terms of the, the, the state or at least the people on the ground. And I think that's something that you could, you could discuss a bit more. On, on that point, by the way, I thought when I, you started writing about the uh, Kagera example, I thought, I'm waiting for, the, for you to discuss Idi Amin. You didn't discuss Idi Amin. Now, when he invaded Tanzania in 1978, of course, the whole story is that he stopped at the Kagera River, right? That, that was the idea that this is, um, he's using the river as, an, as a source of a sort of quote-unquote natural border between Uganda and Tanzania. So the fact is that rivers, even today, in the post-colonial context, still have a lot of relevance. Thanks, Elliot. Dan? Great, thanks. So I, I really like this paper. Um, it provides, I think, a really nice corrective on our standard understandings of partition and, and, its, and its impact. And it has implications for sort of two sorts of literatures, as you highlight. One is how we understand the history of partition. Um, but second, how researchers uh, use African borders as sources of quasi-experimental leverage. So I, I just want to focus quickly on that second thing. Um, so you, you know, the borders may have been drawn for a reason rather than just haphazardly. I mean, I think the paper does a nice job of, of making that case. But the question for causal identification is whether the reason why the border was drawn is orthogonal to the outcome that the ostensibly artificial border is being used to try to explain. Um, and so what I'd like to see the paper do more of is try to identify the specific kinds of outcomes that researchers use ostensibly artificial African borders to try to account for, um, and a laying out explicitly of how the endogeneity of the border drawing process might threaten the inferences that researchers want to make, right? It's one thing to say that, well, there was some consideration. These weren't just darts thrown at a board or, or lines just drawn willy-nilly on a map. But OK, what factors were considered? The paper does a nice job of, of laying out some of those. But how does the consideration of those factors undermine the kinds of inferences that researchers want to use the extensively arbitrary borders to try to account for? Right. And so in that respect, a huge contribution, and it seems to me it'd be very easy for you to do with the data you've already collected, would be to include an appendix that lists all 102 of those arbitrary borders and just codes them as being safe for researchers to take as arbitrary and as sources of a natural experiment or potentially problematic and then add some notes about what sorts of pitfalls might uh, undermine an attempt to, to mistakenly take the border as arbitrary. That could be a hugely cited go-to reference point for any researcher who wants to use arbitrary African borders for, for natural experiments. So I think that'd be easy to do and, and it would be a great addition. Um, the other thing I want to point out is just that like Europeans may have wanted to use the information that they had at their disposal to draw borders 
you know, properly, um, but the coverage of that information was really spotty. And so there's almost certainly an inverse relationship between information quality and border location. They didn't put borders, at least with respect to like kingdoms, uh, they didn't put borders in the center of kingdoms where they knew that there was someone who had power. They put them at the edge and, and the paper acknowledges this, but just in thinking through theoretically how the borders were drawn with respect to kingdoms, they tended to be put in places where they just didn't have very much information. But the implication of that, and you acknowledge this, but it could be emphasized more, is that the specific location of the border, which is the data that we build all of our analyses around, is almost by definition put in the place where we have the least information about where it should go. Now, sometimes that doesn't matter because it's in the middle of a desert, and so it doesn't. there's no people there, so the consequence of getting it wrong isn't huge if you're going to use it as a source of a discontinuity. Um, but just to theoretically play out the fact that there's this inverse relationship between information quality and border location, except when it comes to lakes and rivers, which are visible on the map. But then we have this point that John and Elliot both note, which is that um, rivers are different from lakes because there's lots of like dry stream beds that you could pick or could not pick uh, depending on, there's a lot more leeway in selecting, selecting those. Um, and then another small thing is you talk about things being focal points. Um, that conjures have an image of an actual point, um, but they're not points. They're segments or they're polygons. And so you don't want to talk about focal polygons, but understanding that they're not points uh, underscores some of what's a little bit problematic in thinking of them as focal points that have a single unambiguous implication about where a border should go vis-a-vis -vis their location. Thanks, but great paper. Thank you, Dan. Abit? Yeah, um, first just wanted to echo how nice this paper is. Looking forward, <clears throat> sorry, looking forward to assigning it um, and citing it in the future because I think it's great and, and the data that you bring out is, is fantastic. I had a comment that was similar to um, John's about the contribution of the paper and reframing it, the contribution at least. Um, and I guess this also goes to how, how we think about borders because, so, so you acknowledge in the paper that the spheres of influence were generally decided in Berlin, right? But the specific borders weren't. But then isn't you know carving out the, the spheres of influence a way of border formation itself? Um, and isn't that enough to be considered largely arbitrary? So like the percentage of, land in Africa that was determined by this arbitrary process is much more um, than the percentage of land that's sort of at the peripheries where the borders are. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess I was thinking about it in terms of where do we not form borders? So, namely in the interior of, you know, the, the colonial states. So, we can only observe where borders are drawn, obviously not where they weren't, but not putting a border somewhere in a way is also a form of border formation. Um, so then I was thinking, is this an argument about maybe the arbitrariness of the peripheries or the lack of arbitrariness at the peripheries, which obviously is not the, the precise contribution that you want. Um, but you know, I don't think it diminishes the paper at all. Um, and I, I think maybe another way to reframe it is to think about this along two dimensions that we typically have not in the past. So one is the arbitrary nature and one is a collaborative dimension. Um, so, and, and those two dimensions aren't mutually exclusive or anything, right? So it, the borders can still be arbitrary on the grand scheme of things because, you know, the spheres of influence part, um, but that perhaps the story at the peripheries is more collaborative than we previously thought, which is still, I think, a really interesting contribution. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Abit. Vlad? I'm just gonna keep going as long as there are more questions to give as much feedback as possible for the authors. Um, so keep them coming if you have thoughts. And so I just wanted to quickly echo what other people have said that it's really nice to see other maps being used because I think sometimes sort of our ideas and theories outpace the data that we have available to test these ideas. And so it's nice to see Another source besides uh, Murdoch, having said that, I, I think I would have liked um, a clear comparison in the paper, maybe like a figure where you have the map that you use and then the Murdoch map so that we can see the differences. 
And a couple of small points related to that. So the first one is, could there be some sort of survivorship bias, right? It seems that the map you're using has fewer polities. So it's probably uh, both because of the coding, but could it also be that the colonialists were able to record um, some information that, that then uh, was used by the anthropologists that created this map? Um, I was also wondering if there is evidence of some heterogeneity by colonizers. So did the British, for example, negotiate or, or engage these local communities differently than the French? And finally, um, what, at what point, or, or um, did the borders that you look at, uh, are, are they all sort of uh, defined or, or let me preset this. So the borders that you're looking at, are they the first post-colonial borders or, I'm thinking about the example of Nigeria and Cameroon, right? Where the border changed multiple times, sometimes in the late colonial period and then sort of in the early post-colonial period. So I'm kind of wondering what you would do in that situation. Thank you. Thanks, Vlad. Uh, Alex, next. Um, thanks, yeah, I agree with everyone. This is a really polished paper um, and I'm liking it. I had two questions that were stemming from kind of the discussants and other questions that were asked. The first was, kind of about this debate between uh, kind of arbitrary border theorists and people who treat the borders as arbitrary. And I felt kind of through reading the paper that most of the engagement kind of came around arbitrary border theorists. And I think I agree with John that by and large, a lot of people who make that argument would agree with most of the points in your paper. And so the kind of going through what Dan was talking about with outlining the implications for the kind of exogenous natural experiments would be really useful because that kind of only comes up right at the end almost as an aside. Um, and so I think kind of evening out those uh, references would be uh, good kind of between those two camps. Um, and second, I had a kind of question that was stemming from a lot of the historical evidence that uh, you were using in terms of thinking about uh, tracing through the processes of all these communities kind of going to England and making their case that they shouldn't be included in one border or another or in Southern Africa, you know, groups advocating for their own state to protect themselves from Afrikaner incursion. And I was wondering whether there's a kind of source of potential endogeneity in here, right? You have groups that are worried about uh, getting completely bisected by some border. And so they make an effort to try and prove to the colonial uh, powers that actually they shouldn't be. So over the course of a couple of years, they have to go through functionally some sort of nation building process to try and make this case for themselves. And I was wondering then whether that might feed back into the creation of colonial atlases. So whether there's then a kind of uh, a feeling that these groups are more state-like and are therefore included into it. Whereas groups who weren't threatened with um, complete bifurcation by a colonial state may not have undergone this kind of process. Thank you, Alex. Um, John? It's a very small point and a, and a little anecdote to go with it. Um, I was curious about the accounting of the um, segments of borders, which you did a really fantastic job of, of sort of going to that to that level, to that depth. Um, my my experience in working and doing a study on a border was that there, are, in a lot of cases, little small segments um, that are filled in arbitrarily by the European powers. So there may be some purpose behind borders in places of the border, but then a 30 or 50 kilometer stretch where we need to co connect point A to point B. Um, and so at that, if you're if you're adding those in, I wonder sort of how refined the accounting of the you know three and a half different segments each border there was um, and what to make of those areas that are drawn in. Um, because in fact, those are of course the best places to, to do studies um, of this sort, um, but, but also um, suggest that if there's some population density there that peoples again are, are being divided, a point I come back to. And just a brief anecdote along those lines that I think this audience would appreciate. Um, last month, I was in a little village on the east side of Benin called Afasumo, and it's located around one of these straight lines. And if you look at the, that eastern part of Benin, there's some turns where they're obviously accounting for some factors on the ground, and then a few straight portions. And on one of those straight portions, we literally visited a family compound that has a border demarcation marker between Benin and Nigeria within the courtyard that they use as a clothesline. 
Thanks, John. All right, I don't see any other hands, so maybe I'll ask a question and then um, if the authors would like to respond, I obviously you cannot respond to all of this, but if there are places where you would like to generate some additional feedback or places where you'd like the, the group as a, um, a whole to weigh in on, I would encourage you to focus on that. But I would wanted to ask whether um, there's variation in the pre-colonial polities that you could leverage um, for evaluating the kind of availability of borders. And this echoes something that Clara said, something about like the availability um, or the salience of potential borders when interacting with the colonial state. Um, and one obvious thing that Elliot brought up would be looking at population density, building on the Herbstian argument that um, territory really only mattered in places where there were dense enough populations that the territory was, was more valuable than thinking in terms of people to have um, under one's influence. And so population density might drive the kind of likelihood of having something that looks like a territorial um, demarcation prior to colonialism. The other would be some kind of proxy for um, kind of proximity to another competing polity versus being um, in an area where there's not an obvious alternative um, that could take over. So just like some way to get at where pre-colonial borders may have been more or less likely to be territorial um, and contested that might give you some leverage on what was available to people operating in that time trying to think about um, reasonable borders. All right, so um, John, since, um, I'll turn it over to you, but um, the three of you, anybody can respond if there's something you want to focus on. Cool. Now I'll be, I'll be brief. The, the first thing I wanted to say, this is super useful on many levels. And yes, I definitely won't answer even a, you know, a good number of, you know, you know, most of them, it's impossible for now. But this was super useful feedback. That's the first point. I do want to um ask a couple of i guess just clarify one or two brief points um one is that with your point john about segments in general for coding so what was most of the length of that border defined by right so we use the majority now of course it could be the population density varies along that segment in historical periods as elliot suspected i don't know that the, that did exist i don't think so in the pre-colonial period so Maybe there are proxies, I don't know, but that's what that's what we what we used. And then um, one thing I did want to ask back to, I guess not just Dan who brought up the point, but really everyone. One perhaps tension there is in the paper is that a number of you are right that we don't directly say how that would threaten some uh, of the existing studies. I think initially I, that was that was the goal that Jack and Christie or you know, had in mind, but then it became so involved to actually try, there's so much into each border, there's so much thinking into how each border was made, in fact, that I think we were surprised, at least I, I certainly was, that then that took off, that took the whole paper, and then we thought of you know, the replication part, if you will, or how is this first paper changing what we know for it to be a second paper? So I think one thing that I would like to ask back to all of you is how we might be able to fit, um, you know, um, what essentially what Dan suggested of how what we learn in this paper changes the arbitrary border papers in a way that's doable. And one thing we can definitely do is what what Dan suggested in the panel to have uh, in the appendix to have a border by by border. And what you know, anyone who wants to say you know leverage <laughs> a particular border may need to. Uh, think about, but we thought of doing kind of the more quantitative analysis using borders in a second paper, but then some of you note, and, and I think in part rightly so, that that then this paper doesn't speak enough <laughs> to the consequences, so it's not an easy balance to, to strike, so any further thoughts on that would be helpful, but I'll, I'll stop there in case Jack and Christy have things to add. Yeah, so I'll, I'll chime in with a few things. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, this is like such amazing engagement with the paper, and this is going to be so helpful as we revise it. And this is like, this is the perfect time to get these comments because we like finally finished a concrete draft of the paper, and but we haven't submitted it yet. We don't have like a firm timeline, and like we really want to do as much as we can to to incorporate all these great comments. I, I want to talk sort of mainly about uh, a core point that that John brought up about like what. How exactly do we interpret our results? Because I think this is something we've we've struggled with. Um, going back to an earlier time, we presented it. A question we got, which I think relates directly to the points you raised, is like, 
what is the null hypothesis here? And it's, it's a bit of a moving target because I don't like, I think a lot of people, including like many scholars in this virtual room right now are, are generally more careful, careful about sort of characterizing what they mean by, by arbitrary and uh, with sort of like the appropriate qualifications, but then other strands of the literature sort of make these pretty sweeping statements about how like nothing that like they, they were basically just sort of drawn on on sort of a, an open map in, in Berlin. And so like, it, it's a bit difficult to even pin down exactly what the literature says about this because that it's somewhat uh, contrasting. And so our point, which I, and I think we absolutely want to incorporate John's like valuable points about like, what, what are we arguing here? We're not, we're, we're certainly not arguing that the entire process was not arbitrary, only that there were these two very systematic features that sort of come up again and again and again, the pre-colonial states and the, and the major water bodies. And so I think in, compared, in comparison to some statements in the literature, just sort of showing that anything a systematically determined border sort of overturns that null hypothesis, uh, but then certainly relative to, to sort of other forms, like obviously we, you know, don't, um, don't deny or negate the, the fact that hundreds of, of ethnic and, and other uh, cultural groups were, were partitioned across lines. And this was, you know, impactful in many ways, only that it was sort of more or less predictable um, uh, which groups would do so. So I, I think that that point is extremely well taken and we want to do something with that. Um, I, I think John's second response sort of definitely accurately reflects debates that we've had. Um, I really like Dan's suggestion of uh, for each of the borders, let's sort of say something about the, the systematic features that went into it. Um, that way, we might actually take up that much more space in the paper, but I, I think would provide a, a valuable resource to, to researchers. I think the point about internal borders is excellent. I mean, as Elliot highlighted, I mean, like you look at the, the native authority boundaries or the, the district boundaries within Uganda that, you know, Buganda, Benuro, and Kole Toro, like they all got their own districts. And that was obviously not random. You see exactly the same thing in, in Northern Nigeria with, with the way they created the native authorities there. Um, so that, that's certainly something we could, uh, address it well as well. I mean, there's so many great comments and I don't want to take up more time, but I, I did I did want to address John's comment about framing. Cause I, I think like in terms of the takeaway for people in this room, like, oh, if you, like I, I obviously we love if, you know, people teach this class and, and they cite it, uh, but we sort of absolutely don't want to be sort of quoted as making the argument that no, no, they were perfectly systematic only that there were these two really important factors that often are sort of downplayed for just how important they were for, for drawing the borders. Christy, did you want to add anything? Uh, okay, uh, so uh, I just have one minor point trying to uh, explain a little bit about the uh, geographic features uh, are they more or less arbitrary. I guess uh, we were trying to, uh, we were trying in the paper uh, to make an effort explaining that uh, uh, borders along major rivers are not uh, arbitrary as people think they are, in the sense that uh, obviously uh, uh, major rivers, as they slide through civilizations, create consequences for people on both like sides of the river. And even though like uh, Europeans did just out of expect, uh, expectancy say, okay, this river looks convenient, let's just use that as border, it creates consequences. Uh, along each side that maybe the end, uh, if you want to do, um, uh, use that uh, border as uh, uh, in uh, research design, claim causal uh, effects, uh, um, it's going to be a little bit uh, fuzzy in that sense. And uh, I uh, certainly do agree with uh, many of the points that you raised that, uh, well, yes, most of the time uh, setting over one border with the other is more or less arbitrary, but the fact that most of the major rivers are used uh, as borders uh, kind of tells something. Uh, I guess for uh, uh, the point is well taken that we probably need to uh, uh, explain that part uh, better. Um, and uh, we are kind of in the process of, uh, of uh, like uh, like uh, what some of you suggest, like 
it would be really nice to go through uh, like just uh, border by border of what like systematic uh, factors go into that and how that uh, affects people's thinking of, okay, maybe this one is more arbitrary than that one. And that's really great advice. Thank you. So we have two minutes, uh, so I don't want to waste them. If anybody has an answer, especially to Joanne's question about balancing um, what they're doing in this paper versus the more kind of prescriptive, um, either replication of existing studies or um, more forward orienting, kind of giving people specific guidelines. Does anybody have anything they want to say in the last moment to that question? I mean, I'll take a stab. I mean, I, I don't think you want to go through every paper that's used in African border as a source of natural experiment and try to critique them. But I think what you could do is just give some examples of situations where the facts you've uncovered about why the border was placed where it was might interrupt the ability to use that border as a source of leverage for certain kinds of questions, but not others. For example, if a border was drawn between a kingdom that Murdoch coded as centralized and one is decentralized, then to use that boundary uh, as a discontinuity to understand the impact of, say, I don't know, present day educational systems on literacy, when we know there's a literature suggesting that centralized kingdoms are associated with greater literacy today than less centralized kingdoms or, or something like that, then that would be a problem. But if it's if the outcome you're looking at is some policy uh, that was came out of the mind of some leader that has nothing to do with the centralized versus decentralized nature nature of the kingdom discontinuity at the border, then that would be okay, right? So you could give a couple of examples like that, and then come up with what I think the conclusion should be, which is that having read our paper. Um, people should be really committed to investigating the appropriateness of the border that they're using in their analysis um, as being a source of a random, as if random discontinuity. And look at our appendix for some tips um, before, you, before you do that. Thanks, Dan. Um, okay, thank you all so much for joining and for the kind of broad um, engagement with the paper. I think they got lots of great feedback. I hope that Joan, Christy, and, and Jack think so. Thank you for sharing the paper and thank you especially to John and Clara for, for writing up comments. Um, anybody, I, I would just encourage you to send any additional feedback or thoughts to the authors. Um, I will um, take down all the chats and send them separately as well. Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah, thanks. This is fantastic. Thank you.